The Elder Scrolls series is peppered with a rich assortment of characters, remarkably some of whom pop back up in the series where least expected, from those who are dead and not ready to rise up, those who are dead and still moving, others who are alive and healthy, for now, and those who can never die. So here is every recurring character in the Elder Scrolls series. Welcome to my home underground. <laughs> Cinderian was a proud and famous alchemist known for his researches on the Nernroot plant. What can I do for you today? You here to bring me some Nernroot? In Oblivion, he gives you a reward for each Nernroot plant you give to him. Nernroot doesn't need sunlight to thrive. Don't forget to check underground as well. On 4E52, an adventurer named Obeth Arnesian brought a sample of Crimson Nernroot to Cinderian. Yes, Nernroot. Haven't seen any yet. This variant of the common Nernroot grows only in Black Reach, a gigantic cavern beneath the surface of Skyrim. A year later, he sold his basement workshop in Skingrad and traveled to Skyrim. After a few months of preparation, Cinderian entered Blackreach using the ruined lexicon provided by Obeth and set up a field laboratory in one of the Dwemer houses found within the cavern. In Blackreach, he finally found rare flowers and crimson nern roots, but also Dwemer automatons and farmers. Tragically, when you happen upon Cinderian's journal, his final entry reads, Hopefully the denizens of Blackreach will allow me to gather my samples unhindered. I just didn't have the time to go plant hunting. Now that you're here, that changes things. My wife and I were cleaning out our home, and we came across some of my great-grandfather's things locked in an old chest. I found an unsent letter he'd written to the East Empire Company. In Blood Moon, Gratian Kyrelius was one of these generic miners in the ebony mine of Ravenrock, and it was also possible to hire him as a guard for a quest. He eventually moved away from Ravenrock to dedicate his life to exploring ancient ruins all over Tamriel, while still remaining in the employ of the East Empire Company. In 4E10, he returned to Ravenrock at the request of the company after the mine had broken through into Blood Skull Barrow. Gratian and his assistant Milius entered the ruins, but they were attacked by a drow when Gratian attempted to steal the Blood Skull Blade. Mortally wounded, he died trapped within the ruins. Years later, in Dragonborn, his great grandson, Cressius Kyrelius, sends you to investigate about his death in the mines. Who in the blazes are you? Can't you see I'm busy? Gratian kept a journal of notes about his discoveries. If you can find his remains, I'm hoping it will help. Here's everything I have. The letter, the key. Please, do this for me, so I can finally regain the respect that I've lost. Svenja Snowsoul. He's so sorry his mama swapped him for a dog and then drown the dog. As one of the only survivors of the Udafricto attack on the Thirsk Mead Hall at the time of Blood Moon, Svenja could have known a peaceful existence alongside her husband, waiting the sad and cold death Tamriel reserves to Nords, except that being still haunted by the memory of the Udafricht and the possibility of future attacks, Svenja felt driven to slay the mother of all Udafricts, the Udafricht Matrix. Unfortunately, when you find her in oblivion, it is already too late. She's already been torn asunder and consumed by the beast. Of course, you can still have fun collecting the remains of her corpse. This tale seems to be very reminiscent of Beowulf and the Grendel. Patience! Patience, my love! Lord Kane of Laneland, 
As you will understand soon, meeting old, dead characters from Morrowind is a classic. What is less common, however, is to come face to face with a body straight out of Daggerfall. Lord Kane is typically the character you cross without even seeing. He appears not only in two dwellings with two names, but also two spellings. One of which you can find him in the village of Gisotura in Laneland in a tiny L-shaped residence, this time called Lord Kane, versus his original Kane spelling, which makes more sense because he's the younger brother of Baron Shrike, the current ruler of Laneland, and is determined to end his brother's authoritarian rule over the area. Anyway, one wonders why the developers of Fighter's Stronghold, a DLC for Oblivion, go out of their way to resurrect him in the unpleasant form of a vulgar skeleton. In fact, it is possible for the story of a noble resurrected by a disciple of Manimarko to be mostly a sly reference to the Legacy of Cain series, which I have to add, I'm a huge fan of the theatrics and voice acting of the original Cain. I awoke to the pain of a new existence. The world had changed to my eyes. I had not expected such cruelty from the light. I was forever changed. I knew what I had become. This would change in time for the worse, along with other things. I had crossed death for this moment. My mind was empty save for one thought. I would kill. Karstark. This frost giant was another abomination from Blood Moon, which was the penultimate boss of this extension. that the Dragonborn can resurrect 200 years later to stick him one second beating. Falx Karius. Falx Karius was the leader of Fort Frostmouth. Yes, what can I do for you? I am Captain Falx Karius commander of Fort Frostmoth. During the fulfillment of the Blood Moon prophecy of 3E427, Captain Karius was chosen by her scene to become a prey in the Hunter's Game, along with three other champions from the island. During the hunt, Karius managed to survive by allying himself with the Blood Scar, and then escaped the Mortra Glacier and made his way back to Fort Frostmouth. Later, he was promoted to general, but in 4E5, Fort Frostmouth was almost completely destroyed by the eruption of the Red Mountain never to be rebuilt, and Karius was killed by the debris from the exploding volcano. Two centuries later, he is resurrected with a heartstone by Ildari, presumably to avenge herself from Neloth, but the brave soldier, convinced to be less dead than alive, will rebel and eventually got locked in the ruins of Fort Frostmouth, where the player finally finds him in Dragonborn before killing him without much scruple. Uh, some people are born dumb. Like me, for instance. Ulfgar the Unending. Ulfgar the Unending was a Nord warrior from the Second Era. He and four companions embarked on a quest to find Sovngarde. Have you found it? Have you found the entrance to Sovngarde? However, his companions, Nicholas, Erlinder, and Hunru, were betrayed by the wizard Grimkel, who turned them into stone pillars at Brodia Grove on Solstheim. They were avenged by Ulfgar, who killed the wizard. 500 years later, Ulfgar was somehow still alive and still searching for Sovngarde. In 3E427, he met the Blood Skull, who agreed to help him find the Nordic Paradise. Upon investigating, the Blood Skull informed the ancient Nord that the only way to reach Sovngarde is to die an honorable death in combat. Ulfgar challenged the Blood Skull, hoping to meet such a fate, and the two engaged in mortal combat. In the end, a fourth pillar appeared at Brodia Grove, and Ulfgar, along with his old friends, can be seen in the Hall of Valor of Sovngarde at the end of Skyrim. No, no gloom more. can hold my heart for long in Shore's blessed hall, where no shadows lie. I am Lucian the Chance, a speaker for the Dark Brotherhood, and you... You are a killer. In Oblivion, we meet Lucian the Chance, a member of the Dark Brotherhood living in Cyrodiil. Although, by the end of the Oblivion Crisis, he meets his demise. As you can see, we have dealt with the betrayer, Lucian the Chance. No longer will you serve as his puppet. Two centuries later in Skyrim, it is possible to summon his spirit with the spectral assassin power and to have him fighting at your side. Sithis has been appeased, and the time has come to acknowledge and reward 
your unwavering loyalty. Shadowmere is a mysterious, undead black horse associated with the Dark Brotherhood. In oblivion, Lucien Lachance owned her until he gave her to his new listener. In Skyrim, Astrid owned him until she gave him to a new member of the Brotherhood who had been appointed as listener by the Night Mother. Yes, it's a she in oblivion and a he in Skyrim, but nobody knows why. Every moment counts, so I want you to take my horse. His name is Shadowmere. You'll find him outside by the pool. Let's just say he's... one of us. Unholy matron, we of the Black Hand beseech you. Reveal yourself now, most magnificent Night Mother, so that we may seek your guidance. The Night Mother. The case of the Night Mother, the Grand Mistress of the Dark Brotherhood, is a bit special because nobody really knows if she is a single person or if it is an honorary and transferable title. However, even if the question about her identity remains unsolved, the one thing about her mortality is quickly resolved if we meet a Night Mother in the flesh in Morrowind, the Night Mother only appears as a ghost in Oblivion. You've returned. I trust you've weighed the importance of your new position. For you will soon hear words that will change lives, alter destinies. In Skyrim, there is some progress because this time we face her mummified body. Poor Cicero. Dear Cicero. Such a humble servant. But he will never hear my voice. For he is not the listener. Anecdotally, it is unknown if she actually exists as a person in Daggerfall, but she is one of the many political factions that exist, and a sprite and portrait exist in the game files. What? What treachery? Defiler! Debaser and defiler! You have violated the sanctity of the Night Mother's coffin! Explain yourself! Stand up. There you go. You were dreaming. What's your name? Good old Giob. Giob, the prisoner who welcomes you at the beginning of Morrowind. I heard them say we've reached Morrowind. I'm sure they'll let us go. We know since Oblivion that he had succeeded in driving off all of the cliff races from the island of Vardenfell, which earned him a canonization. They used to crisscross the skies over Morrowind like vermin. Nasty flying creatures with a habit of sneaking upon the unwary. As well as a few fan tributes. Cliff races. In Dawnguard, the first DLC for Skyrim, we learn that he died at the beginning of the Oblivion Crisis in Kavach, and his soul was captured by a Dremora. Join my trophies, Nithing. Now he wanders in Solcan, where all souls trapped in a soul gem go. Since then, without really understanding that he died, I fearlessly charged the enemy. N no. Much too dramatic. Giob softly searches the dispersed pages of his autobiography. I wonder how many copies I sell. Interestingly, he is the only Dunmar in Skyrim dubbed by the Dunmar voice actor of Morrowind. Now, what was it I said to that prisoner? Stand up. There you go. You were dreaming. Yes, that was it. Umbakano. My master, Umbakano, is known across Cyrodiil as a collector of alien antiquities. He's always interested in rare artifacts from that era. Why? Do you have something of interest to my master? We meet Umbakano for the first time in Morrowind in the Imperial Mine of Yasu. You have something to say to me? We also meet him six years later in his home in Oblivion. It is well known in the city that I collect alien antiquities. It's true but I desire only very specific items. Meanwhile, he has clearly made a fortune by collecting alien trinkets. I don't like you and don't want to talk to you. You're a traitor to your own race. 
Volinar, at your service. Need a spell? Need an item recharged? Need a witty practical joke played on someone? I can handle it all. Unlike Umbacano, we first encounter Volinaro as a simple guard in a mine, the Dunarai Caverns in Morrowind. The sun and moons transform day to night, but what transforms the mind? Then he joined the Mages Guild, and if you're looking to join the guild, talk to Jean Frasoric. If nothing else, it means access to better services than most people enjoy. He also worked his way up the ranks, becoming a prominent member of the Guild of Bruma, where you can visit him in Oblivion. It's a little too rugged up here for me. Add a couple hairs to a Nord, and you've got a bear. Nelika. I don't deal with any college applicants these days, so don't bother asking. You're working with the Daedra? Right. Now tell me the one about the Argonian Maid and the Lusty Baron. Like Umbacano and Volinaro, Nelikar was an Ultima working in a mine. I suppose it is my duty to help those less fortunate than myself. In the Dunarai Caverns, at the same time as Volinaro, like the other two Ultimas working in a mine, Nelikar decided to change his life. My patience is limited. Becoming a mage like Volinaro and was a former member of the Winterhold College. Do you think muscling me is going to work? I'm a wizard, an old elven, wizard, think about it. Until he got kicked out because of some failed experiments. What did you do? It was a minor miscalculation. I've already corrected it for future experiments. This, this is why people have a problem with your college, Nelikar. In Skyrim, he will ask you to find Azura Star to continue his experiment, which aims to turn it into a black gem counterpart of the star. Look, I don't care who asked you to find the star, but don't take it back to Azura. The Daedra are evil. They're the reason Malin went insane. My research shows there is likely a shrine in these caves. I'll need you to accompany me to the shrine. Handle any difficulties. Alante of Alinor. Such useless creatures. The fact that the player has probably killed her in Morrowind, she makes researchers into the tomb Mordrin Harnin and attacks you if you approach her, does not prevent them to return to say hello in Oblivion. As in Morrowind, she is still studying the old tombs, but this time, instead of attacking you, she will ask you to protect her. Proof, if needed, that wisdom comes with the number of years. Ah, you must be from the Fighters Guild. Excellent! I'm looking forward to our investigation. Fascinating subject, these Deidre. Umbra. Aye, I know of Umbra. But you're a stranger to me, and I'm not talking. This is, I think, one of the most obvious recurring characters. Character? Not so much. It's a powerful sword, no doubt about that. Jet black. Got a wicked edge on it. And they say it can steal a man's soul. Umbra is a soul-eating sword created by Nain Rawer, and in which Clavicus Vile gave a piece of his power in the process, accidentally creating a sentient being in the form of a sword. It also has the annoying habit to make its wearer crazy. This is what happened to this orc warrior in Morrowind, who lost all will to live, Escape while you can. and to the Bosma warrior in Oblivion driven to a bloodthirst. For years I have fed my blade the souls of man and myrrh, warriors and priests, kings and paupers, men, women and children, all have bled for me. Leading both of these wearers to call themselves by the name of the sword. Umbra is my blade. It is who I am. Who I was meant to be. Hmm. An evil soul-eating sword which has a will of its own and possesses its wearer, driving him to madness. Your bones will be my dinner. <clears throat> Is Umbra the Elder Scrolls version of Soul Edge? Actually, it's a reference to Stormbringer, a soul-eating sword which appears in many Michael Moorcock's works. You will retrieve for me a sword, a very special sword. It contains the soul of Umbra, a hero I have had dealings with in the past. Bring the sword to me, and I'll reward you with my mask. You'll not find a better bargain, mortal. Begin your search in Hell's Gate. You die! Ow! Ah! 
Hello. Hello. Jovenin, High Priest of Mania, at your service. What brings you to this holy place on such a fine day? We first meet this priest of Mania, one of Sheogorath's Daedric Plains, in Shivering Isles, the second extension of Oblivion. Years later, in Skyrim... Please, take pity on an old madman. He will join the mortal planes in the guise of a beggar. My master has abandoned me, abandoned his people, and nothing I say can change his mind. Now he refuses to even see me. He says I interrupt his vacation. It's been so many years. Won't you please help? Determined to bring back his master in his kingdom. His favor is a powerful, powerful thing, and so very worth any inconveniences. Etienne, Felace, and Isabel. In Blood Moon, like their counterparts in Daggerfall, these three witches of Glen Moral will offer to cure yourself from lycanthropy. So these three guys, a Nord, an Orc, and a Wood Elf, walk into the Mead Hall. No, wait, it was a it was a Dark Elf, I think. Two centuries later in Dragonborn, they turned into Hag Ravens, as it seems happened to all witches of Tamriel. Why am I always surrounded by fawning admirers? Creature. Master Neloth is a mage lord and counselor of House Telvanni. At the time of Morrowind, he was a master of Sadrith Mora and resided there in the Tower of Telnaga. Prior to the eruption of Red Mountain in 4E5, he moved to Solstheim, where he created his citadel, Tel Mithrin, and surrounded buildings with cuttings he bought from Morrowind. He was also responsible for transporting several silt striders to Solstheim. I'm running low on heartstones. He also makes experiments on heartstones and does not hesitate to put his old nose in the intrigues of the island, even making a few enemies along the way. You may need to pick away at it to pry the heartstone itself loose, but you look strong. A good luck. The Tribunal, also known as the Living Gods, integral to the plot of Morrowind, where they were thought to have all but disappeared by the end of the Tribunal extension. However, with the release of Elder Scrolls Online, a prequel to the events of Morrowind, Vivek, Amalexia, and Sothasil all return once more. Perhaps we shall chat for a while. Since you really have no other option. Don't with Madame Marco, the King of Worms. In The Elder Scrolls Online, this ultimate master necromancer is one of the main villains, the one who presents the Empire on a silver platter to Molag Bal. Seven centuries later, during the events of Daggerfall, we find him manipulating the hero to get his hands on the artifact that will make him a god. Oddly enough, against all logic, he's back in oblivion 28 years later in his mortal form, without explanation, and we can imagine that he is mere manifestation of the god or an imposter. According to some lore, the Dragon Break caused all the endings of Daggerfall to happen simultaneously. This would have caused multiple incarnations of Manimarko to come into existence. So, the Manimarko of Oblivion would be a version of Manimarko who failed to transform himself into a god yet remained alive and who is not the only Manimarko. I will make you another in a long tradition of worm thralls and take my time in studying you, your very soul will be forfeit to me. Find a fork. Bring it to Big Head. Sing it to Big Head. Big Head. Fresh game. This mad Argonian was, for a long time, the keeper of the Fork of Heripolation, an artifact related to Shea Gorath. After meeting him in Morrowind, the prey approaches. We find him in the Shivering Isles. Still as disturbed as before, he found refuge in the heart of the realm of Sheogorath. The fork for Big Head. Oh, where has Master put the fork? It sings alone, far from home. Sad, sad fork. Sad, sad Big Head. Where he amassed an impressive collection of cutlery, hoping to get his hands on his precious. The fork! The precious, precious fork. Hear how it sings to Big Head. Beautiful, perfect fork of horripilation. Damn 
foreigners. and she's also related to the main quest of Daggerfall and her life is richly documented. It is said for the earlier versions of Daggerfall that this dark elf carries makeup to adopt a Breton appearance and to be better accepted by her subjects. Note that this is also said that the colour of her skin would be in fact due to a lack of communication between the artists responsible for the portraits and sprites and authors responsible for the background. Around 20 years later, she comes back to live in Mournhold, this time as Queen Mother, removed from the political spotlight. We can visit her in Tribunal, the first extension of Morrowind. Approach and be recognized, my good man. Lalu Helseth. Like the mother, Helseth is first seen in Daggerfall and also seems to carry makeup to look like a Breton in early versions of the game. Also related to Daggerfall main quest, he already knows his taste for blackmailing nobles. Around 20 years later, after the death of Eadwir, he returns to Bornhold with his mother. Once there, he joined King Lethan's court. After a relatively short period of time, King Lethan died, leaving the throne of Morrowind to Helseth. This caused rumours that Helseth had poisoned Lethan. After becoming king, Helseth quickly started to cement his hold on power by using the Dark Brotherhood to assassinate a variety of targets, including attempting to kill the recently reborn Nerevarine in Tribunal, the first extension of Morrowind in which he plays an important role. I was born 87 years ago. For 65 years, I've ruled as Tamriel's emperor. But for all these years, I've never been the ruler of my own dreams. I have seen the gates of oblivion beyond which no waking eye may see. Glory and honor to Uriel Septon VII, the only character which appeared since Arena, the first episode of the series. Although it is true, we only see him during the beginning and end sequences. He will repeat the feat in the intro of Daggerfall, this time played by a real actor, who looks a bit like Patrick Stewart. I have one lesser request. If he's only mentioned in Morrowind, Uriel returns true to form for the intro of Oblivion, after which he died quite foolishly. Died, damn you! Stranger. This time, he was voiced by the real Patrick Stewart. See, my wife will not be happy, but I have a Patrick Stewart picture in my wall. Right there. And then my wrap-up London picture. Excuse me, the Empire doesn't run itself, you know. Submit a complaint to the usual department, and I'm sure someone will take care of it. Okado. Have you spotted this tall, bald guy on the left of Uriel Septon in the intro of Daggerfall? This is Okado, the right arm of the Emperor, who will act as a regent after the death of this one in Oblivion. Except that, meanwhile, the one who looks like a human, I guess the elven type is not particularly widespread among the entertainment workers in the suburb of Washington, D.C. An interesting theory states that Okado reached his position as Imperial Battle Mage because he was the player character of Arena, the Eternal Champion the hero who defeated Jaegar Thorn. It makes total sense that the Emperor would grant Thorn's vanquisher his usurped position, but nothing officially confirms this. Read it, and I shall see you in such suffering that you will grovel for the sweet release of death. Mike knows much. Tell some. Mike knows many things others do not. Mike the Liar. Mike the Liar is so recurrent that he became a running gag, kind of an Easter egg with the gift of speech. He enjoys since Morrowind, gratifying the player with informations which are never quite true, but never totally false either. His cup of tea to make references to features the developers had to give up, while appearing to tear down the fourth wall as a sort of medieval Deadpool. He is obviously back in oblivion. Mike longs for a Colovian fur helm. Practical, yet stylish. Mike is very sad he does not have one. In Skyrim, however, he says he is the descendant of the Khajiit encountered in the previous episodes. But should we believe a liar? How does anyone know there was a city of Winterhold? Maik did not see it with his eyes. Did you? And is the Maik, the liar from ESO, the ancestor of those other Maik? 
Maik's father was Kiam, from a long line of Kiams. But Maik does not believe this. His father was a known liar. The Daedra, or Deidre as sometimes they are referred to, are a recurrent antagonistic force in the Elder Scrolls games. You will, no doubt, encounter each Daedra Lord in one shape or form in each game, so instead of individually breaking them down by their appearances, as most are familiar with their stories, I will only note immortal beings who are irregular in their occurrences, such as... WONDERFUL CELEBRATION! Jeez, for everyone! The player character in Oblivion, Shivering Isles. This is the most unexpected recurrent character, and yet he exists. Since our hero ravishes his throne to Sheogorath at the end of Shivering Isles, it means you meet the ancient character player in Skyrim as the Prince of Madness, an appearance that goes against the unwritten rule of the Elder Scrolls, which, until now, made their heroes systematically disappear into Oblivion once their quest is completed. Wait! Scratch that! Cheese for no one. That can be just as much of a celebration if you don't like cheese, true? Thank you so much for watching. This has been a ton of work getting all of the footage, but I really want to give a shout out to the original Imga post and the YouTube video I stumbled across, which was also inspired by the same post, where they basically just did every recurring character without any voiceover, and I thought I wanted to bring it to life, put my own spin on it, and I hope you enjoyed it. But as always, thanks for stopping by, and I'll see you next time, Traveler. Cliff, Cliff.